welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Links in the Chain. And when it comes to the blockchain world, we all know that we're in an innovative space. But determining which innovations are worth focusing on and which have a future is a difficult game. Fortunately, we don't need to do this on our own, as we're joined today by a person who has a proven track record of sniffing out the hot new trends. I'm speaking now with Lisa Loud, CEO of Laps Chain. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. All right. So uh, per first of all, I want to go a little bit into your personal history, just to understand uh, the sort of mindset you come from in terms of uh, being on the edge of financial innovations. So, I know mean, you've worked in the past at PayPal, BitMEX, you worked mm -hmm. uh, in early on in corporate housing, uh, early sharing economy stuff. Talk a little bit through what it's been like to be on that financial innovation Yes, yeah, certainly. So I started out as a developer at uh, Apple. So I studied mathematics and computer science. So I really came from that technical background, but coding wasn't enough for me. So mm -hmm. I gradually expanded um, after Apple, I went to PayPal and helped to launch PayPal Canada um, and then moved on. I just decided in 2017 that PayPal was not actually going to enter the blockchain revolution mm -hmm. in the way that I wanted to. And so I jumped ship and went into the crazy world of cryptocurrency at BitMEX. That was quite a difference. <laughs> but you're right, I was part of the early sharing economy uh, before Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was doing corporate housing. And so I just see a lot of innovation happening in the world today. Everything is changing. Um, and I want to be part of that. I want to be on the cutting edge. And I do believe that fi fintech in general and blockchain specifically have the potential to transform the world economy and the finance of developing countries. Okay, so I mean, that helps us segue neatly into, I suppose, the next major point I want to touch on, which is this you know, talking of the innovations and development of the blockchain economy, really driving it to the next level. A lot of the technology is there, a lot of the base technology is there, but it's still very rough and ready. And, you know, there are many, uh, so we were both at the Ethereal Summit yesterday in Tel Aviv, uh, enjoying uh, all the sights and sounds there. And a, a sort of a constant theme, a mantra, if you will, that came out was this idea that there needs to be more uh, gloss, more shine put on, a little bit more uh, sort of development in that sense, and that bigger companies are often now the ones entering the space in which yes. to do that. Notably, we had a representative of the Libra project, Tomo Burrell, COO of Calibra, mm -hmm. there yesterday uh, speaking on the matter. What are your thoughts on perhaps some of what he said yesterday, but more importantly, on the Libra project as a whole, as an innovator in the space? Yeah, that's a great question. I really think that the uh, Libra project has been positioned as, by many people, as an opposition to the central banks. And to me, there is a completely different use case that's being solved here. The central banks provide money, basically, payments. But if you look at cryptocurrencies, a token can provide four things besides, three things besides money. So really, it has payments built into it. And then it also has uh, compliance because you can identify someone, you can do KYC before they get onto Libra, for example. Mm -hmm. And then it also has regulation. You can tell what the currency is being used for. Something that central banks can't and probably would not want to do is to regulate how the currency is used. And then the fourth thing is that it has uh, identity. So you have, um, you can tell who is buying what, who is using the currency for what. So all of these things bring a lot of utility where uh, the central banks just provide a payment system, a money e economy. So to me, I think that there is an opportunity for central banks to embrace this Libra foundation, um, the Libra concept and to collaborate with them, to see that there's a, another need that is filled that doesn't exist with the central bank system. So, the, I mean, it's interesting to talk about filling needs because uh, certainly there are niches to be filled in the financial sector and many in the fintech space will say that this is the way forward through innovation, private development and whatnot. But when it comes to comparing, I suppose, central banks and, and private interests, Libra is talking about setting up at such a scale as to be on the scale of a central bank, but fundamentally, mm -hmm. it is being run by private businesses and businesses that don't necessarily have the best track record of sort of maintaining regulations and keeping to privacy mm -hmm. standards <laughs> in the past, most notably Facebook, who are heading the project and seem to be the only ones vocally uh, speaking about it at the moment. 
What do you say to that? I mean, is Facebook really the ones that should be spearheading this sort of innovation? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm not really speaking about Facebook in particular. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that there are many solutions that are coming out right now in blockchain. And something like Libra or like Labs Chain, mm -hmm. the, the blockchain that we're building, could solve that problem. Uh, the way that I think of it is, um, Think about the fact that the world as we have to eat, we have to drink, the reality world still exists mm -hmm. and will continue to exist. And we need to have the economy to support that. We can't suddenly stop eating, right? We can't suddenly all switch to Libra or Lapse Chain and be able to live our lives the way they have been. There has to be uh, both sides. On the other hand, the internet has never had its own currency. Mm -hmm. And the digital world is becoming more and more prevalent. We live in a digital world. There is a digital reality all around us. In fact, I like to say it's sort of like, uh, I like Harry, the Harry Potter analogy, mm -hmm. because Harry was living in the world of muggles, and he didn't know that the world of magic existed all around him. He was a, he was a muggle. I think we, today we have bit muggles. Right. We have the people who are living in the existing economy. They don't know about blockchain. They don't know that there's a whole digital reality out there where people can exist in, in, uh, in bits. I think that the, that reality needs to have its own currency. And Libra could fill that. You, have, you make good points about the fact that Facebook hasn't been the best mm. about privacy, but, um, and their current model is very centralized. I do think it needs to be decentralized, but on the other hand, I don't think there's any way to get from nothing to decentralized. You have to have a good distribution before you can get to decentralized. So then I suppose looking at an alternative approach, we can see, for example, I'm not espousing whether this is good, bad, I'm not making that judgment call, but uh, we've seen from the People's Bank of China, they're setting up their central bank digital currency whether that's uh, truly a cryptocurrency or not, many would argue either side, uh, with most saying it, it isn't, but it is certainly mm -hmm. digitizing currency in that way that you mentioned there. Yes. Is that perhaps an approach that central banks around the world can model themselves on, or whether they can or not, should they be doing that? In my opinion, no, they shouldn't be doing that because central banks should not have as much, they shouldn't have power over the, the non-digital world as well as the digital world. Mm -hmm. And I would be uncomfortable if a central bank were doing regulation on all of my payments. Uh, you know, every time I buy an Apple, the, the bank knows about it. That, that seems very uh, scary to me. It seems like too much control and power in one central place. But you'd be okay with Facebook or the Libra Association having that information? Well, because I think that it should be decentralized. Okay. It, it should be, it so, should solve the problem, but not in a centralized way. So then let, let's talk about uh, sort of further afield uh, beyond that. You said that if uh, Libra is a sort of stepping stone to more decentralized projects and, and greater things, what is a sort of ideal model look like to you? Without getting too technical or yeah, specific, yeah. but in a general sense. Yeah, and I think Libra intends to be decentralized mm -hmm. eventually. The challenge is, um, how do you get to decentralized? We have very good decentralization with Bitcoin and Ethereum, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to be difficult to get anything else to that level of decentralization without distribution. But what I think an ideal model would be is something that has the reach of Bitcoin, and has the uh, functionality of Ethereum or future iterations of blockchain um, that is very widely distributed and decentralized. The control is done through, um, is distributed. It's not centralized. So the, the people who own the token have the voting rights on the, on the, the policy of the token. And I think that's the utopia that we're all thinking about. It, the question is, how do we get there? And I think there's a lot of uncertainty about how we get there. Everybody has a theory, everybody has a solution, but we will see what's going to happen over the next few years. Certainly we will see, but I suppose, uh Apart the concerns, uh, some in the sphere about the development of what's existing now and versus what's going to mm -hmm. happen. I mean, I see what you're saying about stepping stones, but when we look at the early days of the internet, a lot of those early innovators and a lot of even the, the architecture of the internet itself was established in a very different world. And a lot of that is still hung over today and it causes a lot of issues surrounding privacy and uh, access to information and uh, you know ability to hack into, into systems and programs exists because that was set up for a world where they were just trying to create the early designs of the internet were trying to create open markets and yes. get access mm -hmm. to everyone. And now as the internet has evolved, some of that early architecture is still, you know, that, that sort of legacy technology still exists and holds back a lot of the modern functions of the internet. 
I would argue and I would wonder that the current existing technology, whether it be we're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, or something like Libra, while we may attempt it to be a stepping stone, this will be the foundation mm -hmm. that sets up the future of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. How would you answer something like that? Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think maybe we can take the lessons of the internet and see where we went wrong, where we went, where we held ourselves back, where it became more commercialized than, uh, than the original intent was. And maybe we can chart the course for blockchain a little more intelligently. Mm -hmm. I hope that, and I do think that because blockchain is much more of a community effort than the internet ever was, the internet was more done by people who knew what they were doing. Blockchain, on the other hand, the whole concept of a DAO is to crowdsource everything. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can collectively gather our wisdom and chart a course that will be beneficial to everyone in the long, in the long run. As the industry grows and, and mass adoption takes over, do you think that there's a risk of losing some of that community voice? Or do you think there's enough built into the architecture that we can uh, securely move ahead with that? You know, I, I don't, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, mm -hmm. but I do think that there was a huge advantage created by Bitcoin where uh, it was all built before everybody, before it was right. popular. And so there was a lot built in and a lot of learning that happened because we were doing it um, altruistically mm -hmm. in a way. The engineers were building it altruistically. Right. So I do think that blockchain, blockchain has the foundation of being uh, something that could evolve into a, a more uh, crowdsourced and more democratic system. It will be interesting to see how that development goes. It will be. But in the meantime, we'll have to have watch carefully and make sure we all pay attention. Lisa Loud, CEO of LapsChain, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Block TV and having this conversation with us here in our studios today. Thank you so much. All right, and in the meantime, stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.